This is Tempest Tossed, Conversations on Migration and Mobility, and I'm Alex Alenikoff. It's the week of the 4th of July, and we thought we'd spend some time talking about the Statue of Liberty and our namesake. The podcast name, Tempest Tossed, comes from Emma Lazarus's famous poem, The New Colossus, and the poem can be found engraved on a plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty. After her well-known phrase, give me your tired, your poor, the poem includes this line, send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Tossed in the Lazarus poem is spelled T-O-S-T. We have changed it to the more familiar T-O-S-S-E-D, I guess you can say we've taken poetic license. In this episode, we talk with May Nye, a professor of history at Columbia University. She talks about the Statue of Liberty's history, how its meaning in the public mind has changed over time, and what its meaning might mean in the future. We also had a conversation with activist and Lady Liberty climber, Patricia Okomo. On July 4th, 2018, almost exactly a year ago, as part of a larger demonstration against Trump administration immigration policies, Patricia climbed the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty in an act of civil disobedience. We conclude with a performance of the Lazarus poem put to music by Barbara Silberg and sung by the West LA Children's Choir. This episode of Tempest Tossed was developed and produced with the assistance of Candace Jaimungal. First, our conversation with Professor May Nye. May Nye, thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, Alex. My pleasure. Um, so the Statue of Liberty now is associated with uh, the idea of immigration to the U.S., but of course it didn't start that way. What was the statute about when it was first thought about? The statue was the brainchild of a French abolitionist, Edward Laboulaye. He was the head of the French Anti-Slavery Society. And he conceived of the idea for the statue in 1865 at the close of the Civil War. Um, his purpose was to honor the African-American slaves and their emancipation from the war. And so he collaborated with the sculptor, um, Frederick Bartholdi. Um, and Bartholdi's early sketches for the statue show a woman holding a broken chain aloft in her hand. Um, and he ended up uh, using... Um, for the rest of the statue, um, for her body, um, something modeled on another proposal he had made for a lighthouse at the entrance of the Suez Canal. Which had a, a, a woman's figure. Attached. Right, had a woman's figure. And so he added, he used that figure, but he added this um, broken chain. Um, he later replaced the chain with a book to represent enlightenment reason, but he left a broken chain around the woman's ankle. And as I understand it, you actually can't see that. If you're a visitor to the island, you actually have to be like in a helicopter above right, the statue this, to right, see the chains right. under the feet. So it's originally about slavery. They dropped that idea. It became about reason and then... Republicanism. Republican. So, right. so when it's so when it's finally uh, mounted and put up, erected in the 1880s, what's, what's it seen as representing? Well, they said it was to represent reason and enlightenment. So she's holding a lamp of enlightenment to the world? Right, and a book. And um, it was known as Francis Gift uh, to America. But, you know, it really did not have the same attraction or meaning that it does today. It's hard for us to understand that. And when does that begin to happen, that transformation? Well... There's a famous poem that's at the base of the Statue of Liberty, right? The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. It has the famous lines, right? Give me your tired, your poor. So that poem was written in 1882, before the statue was even erected. They had a problem that they had to raise money to buy, to build a pedestal. So France had agreed to donate the statue, but the United States was supposed to come up with the pedestal for it to stand on. And Congress didn't want to pay for it. The state of New York didn't want to pay for it. The city of New York didn't want to pay for it. It was about $100,000, so it had to be raised privately. So there were the proverbial bake sales to raise money. Uh, and one of the events was an art auction held by the uh, Brooklyn Art Association in January of 84. And they commissioned 
pieces of art to auction to the public to raise money for the statue. So they asked Mark Twain to send something, and he sent a check, but he said, I'm not, we don't need a statue. Then they asked Emma Lazarus to submit a poem. Uh, she was a young poet at the time, kind of up and coming on the New York literary scene. And she said, well, I don't write to order. But she had an idea, uh, an inspiration about this statue. And so she wrote that poem uh, out of her interest of uh, about the plight of Jews fleeing Russia from the Tsar. And she, she came from a very wealthy family, but I'm sure she was aware of the conditions in the Lower East Side. So, um, so it was printed in the catalog for the art auction. Got a little bit of notice, but not much, and people forgot about it. And when they opened the statue in 1886, they didn't read it. And alas, she died at an early age. She died the next year when she was only 38. So in 1903, a friend of hers rescued the poem and had it engraved in bronze. Um, and they put it on the second story of the pedestal where nobody could see it. So nobody really knew it was there. And the third and final time uh, it was rescued was in 36 by Louis Adamish. It's a very popular and well-known Slovenian-American writer. Um, who was a real advocate for pluralism and inclusion. So he took that plaque and had it moved to the entrance of the, uh, the statue. Um, so why does, it, why does that become meaningful in 1936? Why didn't it resonate with the broader public? So Adamish was um, uh, a real uh, advocate for cultural pluralism, but he was not really a majority viewpoint either. Um, so it was during World War II that what he had recognized in the 30s kind of came more into being after the war with, you know, Americans' um, uh, knowledge about Nazism, right, and what the fascists had done in Germany to the Jews. Um, and also, you know, there are beginnings to be some inklings of support for civil rights for African Americans. So there's this idea of a more open and inclusive society is necessary for democracy, Right. So in 45 is when they moved the plaque to the door, you know, next to the door. Um, and it's really promoted, I think, now by those same ethnics, right, who are really the children and grandchildren of the immigrants from the turn of the century. Right. They embrace it as giving meaning to their own immigration stories or their, their parents' immigration stories. Right, and there are lots of stories of boats coming into New York Harbor. That This was the time of um, unregulated immigration. There weren't quotas between 1880 and the 1920s, and people seeing the statute and saying, ah, I'm here. So the immigrants, in a way, created this themselves as a symbol of immigration. But their kids did. They, they didn't themselves. And in fact, the idea that people cheered the statue as they entered New York Harbor, I think, is a myth. And I'll tell you why. First of all, there are no photograph. There are a lot of photographs from the period, but no photographs of that. Hmm. There's a draw one drawing that uh, was printed in Leslie's Illustrated uh, that did show immigrants looking at the statue as they entered, but they're not cheering. They're just they're not mad or angry, but they're just kind of maybe contemplative. But there's no other contemporary evidence of people cheering the statue, and in fact. It would be hard to do because the statue doesn't face the Atlantic. She faces Manhattan. So if you're coming in, you'd have to turn around to really see what it was, right? Otherwise, they're seeing the back of a woman as they come in. So I think that's part of the myth about, you know, the statue welcoming immigrants. At the time, people were welcome, I mean, in the sense that they were not restricted, yeah, so so you've described a, a statute that's meaning has changed over time. Is is it? What's your thought? Will it change again, or do you think this has become so ingrained as a symbol of immigration that it, at least for the next hundred years, is likely to stay that way? Well, the people that run the Statue of Liberty itself want it to be not just about immigration; they want it to be about liberty, and liberty, of course, is a very capacious term, and it has a lot of room for interpretation and meaning, which actually makes it interesting. Um, but they have a new museum at the Statue of Liberty. And it's it just all, opened recently. Yeah, it's just yeah. opened. It's mostly about the construction of the statue itself. Um, there was a historian's advisory committee who wanted a little more history and a, lot, a little less 
construction detail, uh, <laughs> shall we say. Um, and I think, you know, a better job might be done in terms of complicating the meaning of liberty, how it's meant different things to different people. It's been more inclusive or exclusive, depending on the group and the time, right? So um, Ellis Island is the Immigration Museum, but I think the Statue of Liberty people want it to be thought of in a bigger way. And it's been used that way around the world. There at Tiananmen right. Square, people have pictures of the Statue of Liberty and many of the protests around the world, somehow the statue That's appears. right. She does a lot of work. Yeah. In terms of commercial work as well. Right. She right. does a lot of work for a lot of different interests. Yeah. So, and I imagine also that the, the statute is so associated with this mass flow from Europe to the U.S., but you've done a lot of work, historical work, on migration from other parts of the world. Uh, and to what extent do you think that by focusing on the statute and, and, the, and the coming from Europe that we efface that, those other histories of people coming both to the, from over the Pacific and across the Rio Grande? Well, that's a really important point. Um, and, and, it, and I think it's connected to the association of the Statue of Liberty with the idea that America is a nation of immigrants. And, um, and what I mean by that is, because nation of immigrants emerged in the late 40s and 50s as a kind of popularization of um, an idea that would promote reform of the quota system. So that's right. interesting. So how was, Im I'm interrupting, but how was immigration talked about before that then? Because I, I think a lot of Americans think we've always described ourselves as a nation no, of immigrants. No, so what haven't. was the, the discourse bef in the earlier part of well, that century? When the mass migration was happening? When the mass migration was happening, um, immigrants were a problem. They were a social problem. Hence, you have 41 volumes of the Dillingham Commission to gather social statistics to prove that they're a problem. And right? to justify the national origin. And justify the national ten origin. Years later and, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, immigrants, um, and before this wave of labor migration from Europe, actually immigrant was not really in the popular vocabulary. People called themselves emigrants, or they called themselves, going back earlier, they called themselves pioneers or settlers or colonists even, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole um, phase of American history before the late 19th century industri industrialization period, which is not characterized uh, by, by wage labor, it's not characterized by immigration in the sense of people coming to settle in a new country, right? That's different from somebody who comes as a colonist to recreate a vision of the old country. Right. So people don't really talk about it, much less being a nation of immigrants. So people didn't talk about immigrants in the early 20th century as though they were really people. They talked about them as they were a social problem. Right. So you don't see that many immigrant voices. You see very little of that uh, in the early 20th century. And you mainly have a debate. Are they good or bad for us? And the, and the tide is pushing that it, they're bad for us. So there's, so there's a whole push for 100% Americanism and right, exactly. melting pot assimilation. Right, that's, assim the, that's the dominant discourse at that point. Right. And Nation of Immigrants tells a different story then? So Nation of Immigrants is, is kind of um, uh, the idea that uh, Oscar Hanlon, uh, who is a great immigration historian, he was really our first in the American uh, Academy, uh, Hanlon and John F. Kennedy, who, who wrote a little book called The Nation of Immigrants. Um, what they meant by it is, uh, is not just a descriptive phrase, right? What they meant, and I think the way it is still interpreted, is it's a theory of American, the American nation, and it's a theory of immigration. And that theory is that immigrants come here, they're included, and even if they have to work really hard, and even if they suffer some discrimination here and there, ultimately they make it and they climb up the ladder. Um, so our history is one of one wave after another that gets included and becomes assimilated and becomes American. So that's still a melting pot theory, basically, even if it's well, called Nation of Immigrants? They have variations of it. I mean, you know, there's a multicultural variation that comes later. Um, I think they mean assimilation not so much culturally, but in terms of socioeconomic advancement. I see. So you come into the labor market, you do well, but meanwhile you keep your 
you know, the, the kind of cooking and your your holidays and things that might some of them some of them yeah. thought that but i think they were mostly they were most what they were mostly concerned about was being able to have equal access to an enjoyment of uh, middle class occupations a, a middle class lifestyle the american dream right and uh, and this is something that very large numbers of the so called european ethnics do achieve they are able to move out of the Lower East Side. They either go to Queens or Brooklyn or they go to Long Island, right? And they can buy houses and they buy houses in neighborhoods that are white, right? They're redlined to, to be white. Um, and they have the benefit of a booming economy, a vast expansion of the economy, a great need for white collar and professional and technical labor. Um, and they go, those of them who fought in the war, they have the GI Bill, which gives them free college tuition and uh, a low interest 30 year mortgage to buy a house. So they get catapulted into the middle class, right? Um, they have residential mobility, occupational mobility, and they've made it. And it's not untrue. And do you, right? think, do you think that's still the dominant story America tells itself? Is that what the statute still stands for? Well, we have two stories right now that are competing against each other, right? We have that story, we call it the liberal national story. And there's another story, which is that we're great because we keep people out, right? And um, we're great. America's great because America's white, you know? I mean, that, you, that's the other story. So right now, I, I think both stories are in circulation. Do, do you think the statute can still fulfill that purpose, or should we be moving to other other ways of thinking about the country other than, as you've described, nation of immigrants or other kind of uh, other kinds of symbols uh, around the United States? Or does that story still work? Well, she's still working really hard to, um, to promote that story. I mean, the statue is invoked as the symbol of an immigration inclusion society. Um, the problem is... Well, there are two problems. One is this underlying issue of how people interpret it, right? Do they interpret it as this is what we are, this is what we should be, this is our ideal, or this is how we've always been? You know, it's, it's subject to all those interpretations. But aside from that, the other problem with it is that it faces, uh, it deals with Atlantic migrations. It doesn't deal with people from the Western Hemisphere, from Central America, Mexico. It certainly doesn't deal with the Pacific. Um, and the analog to Ellis Island in New York Harbor, of course, is Angel Island in San Francisco Bay, which is the immigration station built not to let people in, but to keep people out, right? So we have many different immigration stories. So I think that's, that's a, a liability that the statue has to live with, or we have to live with. So yeah, well, that makes me I wouldn't say just yeah. toss it. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think you know we should toss her into the, you know, heap of history or anything, but I think we have to think of other ways to actually signal something that is more inclusive. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we spoke with Patricia Okomo, the activist widely recognized for climbing Lady Liberty, one year ago this week on July fourth, twenty eighteen. Patricia was part of a demonstration organized by the group Rise and Resist. Rise and Resist defines itself as a direct action group committed to opposing, disrupting, and defeating government acts that threaten democracy, equality, and civil liberties. It's based in New York City and was formed in response to the 2016 election of Donald Trump. On Liberty Island, Patricia took part in the unfurling of a banner that said, Abolish ICE. And then she decided to climb up the pedestal of the statue in protest of the separation of children at the U.S.-Mexico border. She remained at the foot of Lady Liberty for three and a half hours until she was brought down and arrested. In March of this year, Patricia was sentenced to five years probation and 200 hours of community service. We recorded this interview in a bookshop in New York City, so from time to time you may hear some background conversation of the customers. I started by asking Patricia what got her to the Statue of Liberty. The way I wound up at the Statue of Liberty is an interesting story. I had rise and resist in mind because, as I say, after Trump won the elections and I was 
vividly, vividly, vividly opposing his administration from early on. I had been, it was like a part-time job, so I, I was already an activist. I was seen at every event, and I came across many of other groups and organizations, including Rise and Resist. So on April 10, I go to day meetings um, inside this church, and I'm interested at what I'm hearing in the process. It looks so professionally done, and the people seem so devoted to activism. I see this group, just about three people, with a banner that says Abolish Ice. And that was the first day of introducing the group, the, the committee, immigration committee. So I'm asked to join the immigration committee, and I joined also the action committee. Both two committees were working on an event, a, a little special event around immigration and the child separation. So someone mentioned this uh, Staten Island Ferry because they had had a successful uh, event there. There was a lot of people and there was a banner drop, in fact, right from the, the boat. And I suggested we do that on July 4th. But I don't recall saying the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> I've never been to the Statue of Liberty prior to July 4th, 2018. And here we are. It only took about three weeks to put this uh, event together, get the banners, find out about the law, uh, if, um, event going on site, which I didn't do. Some people did to check the wind level, the height level. Um, so when we get there, we gather at Battery Park, and we have T-shirts lettering Abolish Ice, and we have a banner which we put on a hidden in bag backpacks. The plan was about 12 people to 15 will stay on the ground and uh, wear the T-shirts. I started thinking about climbing on our last meeting. So here I am told, hey, listen, it's the 4th of July, the biggest holiday ever in the year. And there are children in cages, which our government has placed there. And Rise and Resist is going to get you there, even though you've never been there before. So they were buying the ticket for everybody to enter Liberty Island. And I said, okay. Once we arrived there, I started wondering, how am I going to climb this? But I went on with the event. My part in my, the role I played was a banner drop. I was part of the group that dropped the, unfolded the banner and dropped it just below the pedestal on this, at this railing. Um, those, the, that group particularly was risking arrest. They knew they were going to be involved in civil disobedience if it got there. And the reason I joined is only because we were risking, we were not planning to, to be arrested. And here I am climbing the Statue of Liberty. So the first officer who came to the group that was risking arrest tussled with us and this banner. We didn't want it taken. What did the banner say? The banner also say abolish ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement. And it was huge. They may allow certain sizes on Liberty Island, but we may have exceeded the size limit. And we knew it could be confiscated, and it was. We never uh, uh, got it back. I don't know if we did. And did. Did you start to put it on the pedestal, and did it get unfurled? Yes, it did get unfurled. Um, and we had we were buying some time before the the police came. We may have had fifteen to twenty minutes. When this officer came, I could remember him uh, <laughs> holding on to the banner, and I was also holding on tight to the banner because there was we had a strategy. Somebody was going to distract him by talking to him about letting the banner go and just letting us go. And somehow. When he took us into custody, I say us uh, barely because I was in, I didn't follow them. And I had to go high as high as I could uh, by climbing the Statue of Liberty. I wanted to uh, create an awareness 
I was sick and tired of doing the same work that wasn't really producing result, which was marching, protesting um, peacefully. So there had to be other ways to protest peacefully and still get the attention around the, this immigration policy. I recall the Statue of Liberty symbolizing freedom and liberty and a welcoming venue for all. It was a place where foreigners came and landed in New York Harbor and the first thing they saw was the Statue of Liberty. The Lady Liberty was a black woman from Egypt. She was donated to by France to the U.S. as a way to thank us for abolishing slavery. Um, in fact, she, she has chains that she breaks free from. When I was up there, I recognized her, her spirit, her, her presence, and her strength. And I had a conversation with her when the officer was telling me to calm down, that I need to calm down. And I didn't want to come down until the children were liberated. I told Lady Liberty if it was okay for me to stay there, if she had a problem with it. She said, no, 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 by all means, please stay as long as you want. So I went and took a nap. And I took a nap under her, her sandal, thinking how this is natural. Migration is a natural phenomenon. So I'm there sitting at the base of the Statue of Liberty. I feel that freedom. She stands for unity, freedom, liberation, togetherness. She reminds us we are people with values, that we, the distinction between us and animals is that we have brains to think about our conduct and to restrain ourselves from violence so we can live together in unity and solidarity. She is a, a symbol of welcoming to immigrants. This country was founded on immigration. And uh, she reminds us of that, what, how we came together and founded this nation, this beautiful U.S., America. But the f every single time, every second we forget, we we're digging our own grave. If we could just remember what Lady Liberty stands for, we will find our path. It's a like light showing you the way to liberation and to heaven. You've been listening to Tempest Tossed, a production of the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School. Our engineer is Sahil Ansari at Dodge 112. 